Hey, Bear, we're going to configure some DHCP failover between two DHCP servers in Windows Server 2022. You want to help? No, okay, you just nap. It's fine. He's always been more of an active directory kind of dog anyway. Hey everybody, welcome. Troy here and you are in the middle of my Fundamentals of Land Management video series. This is the second video on DHCP and in this video we're going to configure DHCP failover between two Windows Server 2022 DHCP servers. Man, that was a lot of DHCP. As always, timestamps in the description below. Feel free to jump to any particular section of the video that you're most interested in. Otherwise, walk with me step by step the whole way. We're going to get this done. Okay, let's dive into our topology, which looks just like this. Now, as I mentioned, this is the second video in two videos on DHCP. The first video, there's a link to it in the description below if you want to check out how we got to this point. Now, we started off with a server running Windows Server 2022, and on that server, we deployed the role of DHCP. We configured a scope for the local area network, and that server is handing out IPv4 addresses to a Windows 10 client called PC01. And that PC01 is running a version of Windows 10 Professional, and the address is obviously received by DHCP. Now in this video, what I want to do is I want to deploy a second Windows server running DHCP. I'm going to call it DHCP2. Now the role of this server is going to provide load balancing and fault tolerance for my network. Now when I say fault tolerance, I'm talking about redundancy. I'm talking about failover. I'm talking about what happens if something happens to my primary server. So if this server suddenly decided to take a vacation, all my clients on this network are no longer going to be able to receive DHCP addresses. So to fix that, I'm going to deploy a second DHCP server and I'm going to use a failover configuration that will connect these two machines in such a way that they'll talk to each other and support each other when they're both running and in the event that one of them goes down, the other will step up and provide DHCP services to the entire network. All right, this is going to be cool. All right, let's turn to our virtual machines. I've got three of them running. I'm going to start off with DHCP1. Now, this is already configured in the other video. So if you want to see how I got this far, again, take a look at that link below. It is running DHCP. I can check in my manager here. And you're going to see that I'm running an IPv4 scope called, let's expand this here, get over here, like so, called DataLand. And you can see that I've got a pool of 192.168.0.50 to 192.168.0.100. Excellent. Now, PC1 is sitting over here quietly receiving addresses from DHCP1. Again, all in the previous video, I can verify via command line IP config forward slash all. There it is. You can see that it's received the address of 192.168.0.50 and it is received that address from my friend DHCP1, which is addressed at 192.168.0.1. Perfect, all according to my topology. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna build that second server. Here's what I've done so far. I have deployed it, I have named it, and I have given it an address. Let me pop into my server manager and show you what I mean. I'm going to disable that little pop-up. See, my local server, all I've done is named it DHCP02, and what I've done is I've given it an address of 192.168.0.2. Now again, I've statically assigned this address because pretty rare that I would want a server to receive a DHCP address, mainly because I don't want its address to change suddenly and disrupt my network and devices that are counting on it. But that's all I've done. And what I want to do now is going to breeze through this configuration where I'm going to make this a second DHCP server for this environment in a failover configuration. Let's start with installing the DHCP role. I'm going to start off with my adding roles and services. Let's burn through. It is a role-based configuration. Again, I'm going to verify that my server pool is showing the exact specs that I want. DHCP2, the proper name machine, as well as the IP address of the machine that I'm targeting. I'm going to hit next. 
and I'm going to install DHCP. Along comes all the management features that come with it. Next again, I can just hit past this because this is the only rule that I want to install and I get a chance to install. Now again, this server installation is fairly quick. It only takes a moment, does not require a server reboot. Um, just a moment of time to install this on this machine and we will be up and running. And there we go, we are all set. I'm gonna hit close and I'm gonna notice that my DHCP is now on the left hand side showing that this role is now active. Again, I see that there is a post deployment configuration required right there. I'm gonna take the chance now to finish this off. What does this configuration do? As before, I am going to use this step to commit the creation of these specific security groups that will allow us to manage this particular uh, DHCP role specifically. It just takes a second. That is now finished and we are all set. I'm going to go to my DHCP snap in under the tools menu. Again, I could right click in server manager, but look at this. I am now all set and good to go. Now, again, there are no scopes associated with its DHCP server. It's got the role, but it's not actually doing anything. Now, under normal circumstances, if this was a primary authoritative source for DHCP, I would right click here and I'd create a new scope and away I'd go. But this isn't a normal set of circumstances. This server is going to be a backup server, a failover server in partnership with DHCP one. So here's how I'm going to configure this. I'm going to go back to my primary server. I'm going to move over to DHCP one. Let me uh, clear that server manager so you can see this a little bit better. Now, what I'm going to do here with this particular scope is I'm going to create a connection between this server and the other server in something we call a failover configuration. So let's start with my data land scope. I'm going to right click on this and I have an option called configure failover and up comes a handy little wizard. Now, here's what's going to happen. It's going to be a failover configuration for this current scope, which is the network 192.168.0.0. Next we go and you're going to see now I get a chance to name the partner server in this failover configuration. I can do this via IP address or if my DNS is such, I can find it in my work group or active directory. Let me show you both ways. First way, I'm going to simply type in the address of that alternate server 192.168.0.2. I hit next and it takes me to the new relationship settings. The other way I can do this, I'm going to pop back. I'm going to go to add server. I can browse for it in my environment. That server is named DHCP02. I can check the names and my server has found it as a member of this work group. This is even easier if it's Active Directory contained because I would be searching Active Directory for this alternate server and it will come up nice and quick. I'm going to hit OK and now you can see that I can also choose this server for the next step. Fantastic. I'm going to hit the next button and now I get to name this relationship. Again, there's a default. The relationship is DHCP01. I can leave that or I can change it if we want. I'm just needing to name it so I can differentiate it from other particular failover relationships if I want it. Now, the first thing I have to choose is what do I want? Load balance or hot standby? Load balance means that both servers will be listening for and responding to queries on the network. When I'm talking about queries, I'm talking about DHCP discover requests sent by different clients. The load balancing configuration means that when they're both running, they're both handing out addresses. Now the alternative configuration is something we call hot standby. Now in this configuration, there's only one server that's actually doing all the query responses in the network and the second server is just waiting quietly and will only respond in the event that the first one is no longer capable of doing so. Each configuration suits different circumstances. My preference is generally the load balance because I can have both servers cooperating and handling queries, which generally provides a better performance in my network. Now I get a chance to determine the load balance percentage. What the servers are going to do is determine if there's a primary and secondary or they're going to be equal partners in terms of handing out the scopes. There's different scenarios here. You'll find different best practices based on different environments. Often you'll see an 80-20 split or a 50-50 split, which you can see is the default value. 
Now, what I'm gonna do here is I can choose to enable authentication of this particular failover relationship by giving it a shared secret password. Let me just type in something really easy, such as the word password, which I will use to authenticate on the other side. Let's hit the next button. Now we get a summary of what we're configuring. This is a failover relationship between DHCP1 and DHCP2, which is also 192.168.0.2, based on the following parameters. We're going to share the scope that is set in the primary DHCP server, 5050, and I'm going to hit finish, and it has now created this failover configuration. It was literally that fast. I'm going to hit close. Now I'm going to go back to my other server and we'll see what's on the other side. I can always right click and I can take a look at the properties and you're going to see that my failover is configured to my partner server at 192.168.0.2. It's good to go. Everything seems to be in order. Let's move over to that other server. And there we are. You see, I have no scope here, but if I refresh, it has now pulled the information from the first server. So my buddy over there, DHCP1, is actively sharing information. Let's take a look at the details of this scope. All this information come from DHCP1. There's the pool, 192.168.0.50 to 100. Here's the leases, look at this. This is a leased address from PC01. And it also recognizes the fact that we actually set this machine up, this PC01, as a reservation, which means that it should hand out the address of 192.168.0.50 all the time. It similarly pulled all the information about the rest of the TCP IP settings that my client devices need, including the router, the address of the default gateway, as well as the DNS servers that I configured as part of the scope options on the primary server. So now what you're seeing here is that my second machine, didn't. I didn't have to build a scope for this. I simply pulled the information from the other scope. Fantastic. Now let's test it. As always, we're going to verify. I'm going to minimize my virtual machine and I'm going to go to my server. Okay, now here's what I want to do. I want to challenge my environment. I want to see if the failover will work. Now I showed you that when I pulled this information from my first IP config, when I verified this information, I could see very clearly that the server that responded was the only DHCP server at the time, which was DHCP01, and it had the address of 192.168.0.1. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna disable or turn off this other server, the first server, and I'm gonna see if my client machine can actually get an address from the failover server, the backup server, the partner server, DHCP2. All right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go into, let's go to DHCP1. Okay, let's make it nice and easy. I'm going to go to my network and sharing settings. And I am simply going to disable the adapter. Boom. Okay. Now, it is effectively off the network. There is no communication to this particular server. Now, what that means is that my pal over here at DHCP2 should realize very quickly that its partner is offline. It is assuming complete control of all the DHCP requirements or queries in this LAN environment. Let's see if it's going to respond to my friend 192.168.0.50, otherwise known as PC01. Okay, let's go over to my friend PC01, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to force an address renewal, a DHCP renewal. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to open up my command line, and this particular action does require an administrator prompt, so I'm going to run as an administrator, and I'm going to type in the words IP config followed by the release option. There we go like so, and you can see that it has released the IPv4 information. If I do an IP config, you're gonna see that there is no IP address. Now let's renew it and see if my second DHCP server will respond with an address. Renew, that's what I'm gonna do. So I did a release and now I'm doing an IP config renew and let's see what happens here. Excellent. So I have received the same IP address. Now I expect that because remember in this environment, this is actually a reserved address for PC1. 
every single time this computer, PC01, based on the MAC address, asks for a IP address, it should be 192.168.0.50. The question is, who responded? Which was the server that actually gave it this information? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a, a little bit of an up arrow here, and instead of renew, I'm gonna use the uh, argument of all, and lo and behold, I can see all the information, but look at this. The DHCP server that responded was 192.168.0.2, that is DHCP02. My failover is working exactly as intended. That's fantastic. That means that even despite the fact that DHCP01 is off the rails, it's gone on vacation, it's sleeping, it's napping, it's tired, it's powered down, my DHCP02 is actually servicing this network with IPv4 addresses. Now I hope that worked out as well for you as it did for me. Feel free to check out some of the other videos in the series as we continue our walk through the fundamentals of local area network management. See you soon.